Thank you very much, Pete. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Simon Wardley. I'm from the Leading Edge Forum. Um, I actually research into organizing IT for the future. It's one of six topics that we actually cover. Now, for those of you who don't know me, um, a little bit of background on myself. I'm a former CEO of a Canon subsidiary. I'm a recovering management consultant, and I'm a scientist by training. Now, quick word of warning. If it's not obvious already, I like cat pictures. Secondly, being a scientist, I also like graphs. So I've plotted a quick graph. This is the level of audience pain, that's you, against the number of slides given in a 30-minute presentation. And I reckon there's a safe limit of about 20 slides. Now, being a scientist, I like to experiment. So today, I'll be using no less than 224 slides. I know what you're probably thinking, but don't worry if you do get a bit lost. This is a talk on cloud computing, and being lost is normal. So we better start with a definition of what is the cloud. The best definition out there is NIST. That's the National Institute of Science and Technology. If you haven't seen it, here it is. <laughs> Can't read it? Good. The most useful thing that it says is that cloud computing is an evolving paradigm. That's consultant speak for we don't know what cloud is yet. <laughs> but don't worry, as Steve Ballmer, Microsoft's CEO said, the real thing to do today is to capture what are the dimensions of the thing that literally I will tell you we're betting our company on and pretty much everybody else in the technology industry is betting their companies on too. Translation, we don't know what cloud is yet. Bet your company on it. Everybody else is. Fortunately, cloud does open up exciting new prospects for the employment and use of computers on a ways and on a scale that would have seemed pure fantasy just five years ago. The bad news is this was written in 1966 <laughs> by Douglas Parkhill in the challenge of the computer utility, where he predicted that in the future, computer resources would be provided through large utilities. They would be online and utility-based. There would be private, public, government, and community utilities. And they would cover everything from hardware to applications. By pure coincidence, 44 years later, this is what NIST says the cloud is. So what's changed? I thought I'd start this topic today by looking at what's happened, and looking at a concept known as business evolution. And I'm going to use that to explain what the cloud actually is. Then I'm going to look at why it's happening now, why it didn't happen 44 years ago. And then we're going to look at some of the benefits and risks of cloud computing. So let's start with evolution. Let's take something simple, like the first ever phone, the hand-cranked double phone. Now, the first question we need to ask ourselves is, how did the phone spread in society? How did it become ubiquitous? Well. If we plot a graph of rate of adoption over time, then when the, phone, the first phones were introduced, you had this early phase, this rapid growth of adoption as the early adopters jumped on board this new exciting technology. Then it moved into a more mature phase where the majority started to buy phones, and eventually it moved into a declining phase where the only people buying phones were the laggards. Of course, all those early adopters had moved on to the next new wave, the, the rotary dial phone. Now, this distribution curve is fairly standard for any product. Uh, we normally display it as a cumulative, so we take the total adoption, and you get this S-curve shape, and this is known as a diffusion curve. Now, Ever Rogers first predicted these, and you find them everywhere, whether you're talking about individual products, or whether you're talking about entire industries, such as the telephone industry, the car industry. Now, all these curves are approximately S-shape. Some of them are slightly compressed. Some of them are elongated. Problem is, this is about diffusion, how something spreads. It doesn't tell us how that industry evolves. And it's great to know how the telephone industry spread in society, but we want to know how it's changing. So if I take that 
S curve for the entire telephone industry. And I'm just going to expand a small part of it. What we find is that underneath this is a wave of S curves related to specific products. And those products and that product cycle is all about maturing products. They become better phones or better ways of achieving the same activity. Now, maturity is a great word here because Eureka, that implies evolution. So I'm going to map a new graph. What I'm going to look at is the ubiquity of something against certainty, how well defined, how well understood, how mature it is. And this is real data. This is TVs, phones, and VCRs plotted against these axes. And what this shows is there's a relationship between the ubiquity and the certainty of an activity. There's a pathway for how a rare and poorly understood innovation, such as the, the hand crank double, eventually becomes common and well-defined, more commodity-like. Now, you can see this in IT. Take something like CRM, Customer Relationship Management Systems. We've gone from the innovation of early list in the 1980s to custom-built database marketing systems in the mid-80s, to the first products like Siebel, to the utility services of Salesforce today. You can see this with infrastructure. We've gone from the innovation of the Z3 in 1941, custom-built systems like Leo. We've moved on to the first products like the IBM 650, constant improvement of products, the introduction of services like Timeshare, commodity hardware, and then utility services of Amazon. Now, it's not just IT that's affected. All business activities are affected by this transition. You can see this in electricity provision. From the innovation of Wollaston, the first products like the Hippolyte Pixie, all the way to the formation of national grids. All business activities are somewhere on that curve. All of them are evolving. They're moving through a common life cycle. Innovation, custom built, product, services, commodity, and utility services. Now we call this commoditization. So why does commoditization occur? Well, ask any businessman and they will tell you that business is little more than warfare. It's a cat fight. And as soon as one competitor gains some form of advantage with some new technology, some new big gun, like an e-commerce site, then everyone else will follow suit. Hence, there is a constant demand for anything which is useful. But equally, there's a competition to supply this. And any time anybody introduces a new thing, such as kit and armor, someone will make a better version. So there is a constant drive for improvement. And it's those two forces of user competition, supply competition, which drive the process of commoditization. So what's happening in IT today is a whole range of activities which were at one point innovations, but more recently have been provided as products with feature differentiation, have become so widespread and so feature complete, they've moved up that curve and become suitable for utility service provision. Now, if we take our computing stack from the applications we build, the database and frameworks we use, the underlying hardware, and move it to the side and simply characterize it into three layers of infrastructure, platform, and software, then all cloud represents is a shift of a bunch of activities across that computing stack from an as a product to as a service world, to utility services. And this is exactly what Douglas Parkhill predicted back in 1966. So why now? Why didn't it occur beforehand? Well, there are a number of barriers to the process of evolution. Um, to explain these, I'm going to look at one simple example, the shift from custom-built to product. And I'm going to use the Industrial Revolution as an example of this. So the Industrial Revolution was a time where we went from custom-built to mass production. And this change depended upon a number of different factors. First, you had to have the concept of mass production. Then you had to have activities which were suitable for mass production. You needed the technology to achieve this. And you also needed a willingness in society to adopt these new models. This is what enabled that shift, enabled the Industrial Revolution. When we look at the shift from products to utility services, you see the same four factors. So using cloud computing, 
We needed the concept of cloud computing, but we've had that for 44 years. We needed activities to be suitable for this transition. Well, that's happened in the last decade. We needed the technology to achieve this. And there are a number of enabling technologies, things like virtualization, but they've been around since Poppet wrote the book on the subject in 1974. Yes, it's got better on x86 hardware, but technology's been there. The key critical factor was a change in business attitude. Now, that attitude of business to IT has been changing ever since Paul Strassman in the 1990s showed that there was no correlation between IT spending and business value. This was then refined by a chap called Nick Carr, who showed that ubiquity was the key, i.e. As activities become ubiquitous, they have diminishing strategic value. They move from being a source of competitive advantage to simply being a cost of doing business. Now, I was at a forum with 60-odd CIOs, and we looked at a range of activities, things like payroll, HR systems, CRM, ERP, sales automation. All of them, they considered nothing more than a cost of doing business, which led to an obvious question why were they spending 600 million between them customizing stuff which has no strategic value? Well, the answer to that is generally they were spending huge sums because the consultants had told them they could gain competitive advantage through customizing their payroll systems. And that was true way back when payroll was something relatively new. Of course, nowadays it's ubiquitous, it's well defined, everybody has that system. So instead, what they're looking for is standardized services, ideally provided through a marketplace of providers with easy switching between them. So we have concept suitability, technology, changing attitudes, so we have all the factors to enable the shift from an as a product to an as a service world. So I've covered a lot, so I'm gonna quickly recap. I started with um, the diffusion curve, Everett Rogers' S-curve shape of how activities spread in society, and from that, we developed a graph for the evolution of activities, how they move from innovation to more of a commodity and utility services. This process is known as commoditization. It's driven by two forces, user competition, supply competition. So what's happening in IT today is a wide range of activities, which were once innovations, have simply become so widespread, so feature complete, they've become suitable for utility service provision. Of course, suitability is only one of four factors that you need. You need concept, suitability, technology, change in business attitude, those we have today. And that is why cloud computing is happening now. So what are the benefits and risks that cloud computing creates? Well, the benefits are standard to the evolution of any activity. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about computer resources or electricity. These are things like economies of scale through volume operations, the ability to focus on core activities through outsourcing, and paper use through utility charging, the conversion of CapEx to OpEx. All of these increase the efficiency with which a computer resource is provided. Now this tends to lead people to believe that cloud is going to reduce your IT spend. But hang on a minute, there are a couple of other consequences here. One of them is increased agility through self-service. So this is data from one company. This is how long it used to take them to get a new server up and running from the initial request to final deployment. 72,000 minutes, 50 days, two months. This is their cloud time, three minutes, and for a 64 node cluster, five minutes. This is an incredible difference in terms of getting stuff done. Now, Commoditization just doesn't affect agility, it also impacts innovation through two forces, creative destruction and componentization, and they're worth explaining. So a chap called Joseph Schumpeter once explained that the impulse that keeps the capitalist engine in motion is the constant creation of new stuff. But this new stuff requires destruction of value in the old, hence he coined a term creative destruction. So what's happening? is as activities commoditize, they erode in value, and that enables further innovation. For example, we need easily available power, data processing, and communication before we can have things like search engines and Google. 
Now, commoditization doesn't just enable, it accelerates the process of innovation through something called componentization from Herbert Simon's theory of hierarchy. Now, formally, what it says is the rate of evolution of a system is dependent upon the organization of its subsystems. However, in plain English, if you think about developing an application today, it's relatively fast because it's built with stable things like databases and frameworks, which depend upon stable components like operating systems and hardware. If none of this was stable, then every time you built an application, you'd have to start by first designing the CPU. And of course, this would take orders of magnitude longer. So the shift of IT activities towards standard interchangeable components provided through utility services should accelerate the rate of innovation within IT. And we've seen this before. We saw this in the Industrial Revolution, where every machine was built with individually fitted nuts and bolts. One nut would fit one bolt, no other. And then Maudsley created the screw cutting lathe and suddenly you had interchangeable components and suddenly there was an explosion of innovation. So you've got commoditization increasing agility and innovation. It also increases opportunities for use through three forces, the long tail, price elasticity, and co-evolution. I'm going to go through these. Most businesses have a long tail of unmet demand. There's only certain amounts that we can do. We're limited by the resources of IT. So you make IT more efficient, you can do more. And if you look at price elasticity effects, then every time we've reduced the price, basic resources, the consumption has gone up to more than compensate for it. Now there's another effect here called co-evolution. And to explain this, I'm going to look at the, the humble electronic switch. From the innovation of Fleming's valve in 1904 to the first products combining multiple switches, such as the Intel 4004. These products enabled new industries to form, things like digital calculators, digital computers. And as they grew, they drove commoditization of switching. So they co-evolved together. And this commoditization of switching enabled new innovation, things like mobile phones, digital cameras. The net effect is we went from one switch in 1904 to a number so big, I can't even say it. So you have increased agility, innovation, opportunities for use through co-evolution and the long tail of un unmet demand. The consequence of all of this is that yes, cloud computing makes things more efficient, but as a result of it, our consumption goes up through the roof. And we've known this since 1865, and Jevons paradox. Jevons said that technology progress that increases the rate of efficiency with which a resource is used tends to increase the consumption of that resource. So he was actually talking about coal at the time, because they made steam engines more efficient. And people thought, well, that's going to mean we'll need less coal. Quite the opposite happened. Coal consumption went up through the roof because more uses were found for steam engines. Bring it back closer to home. This is Ray Kurzweil's diagram of the cost or how much computing resource you get for $1,000 over time. And it's a logarithmic scale on the left. So basically, since the 1980s to today, you now get a million times more computing resource for $1,000. Does that mean IT budgets have reduced by a million fold in that time? No, we've just done vastly more. So cloud is not going to reduce my IT budget. Do I have a choice over whether I use cloud? Well, the answer to that is ultimately no. It's the same with electricity provision. I mean, technically, you could have a choice. You don't have to use the standard electricity supply. You could build your own generators, your own standards, and everything else. The only thing that's likely to create, however, is a competitive gap between you and your competitors as they take advantage of all these benefits. This is why there is always a constant pressure to keep up with activities as they commoditize. And this is known as the Red Queen hypothesis. Formally, it states you need to continuously evolve in order to stand still relative to a surrounding ecosystem. In plain English, there's no point turning up to the cat fight with a snazzy rifle if everybody else has got tanks. You have no choice to keep up. IT is an arms race. So you have no choice. Well, 
that's actually not 100% true either, because you do have a choice over implementation. Ideally, what you're looking for is standardized services provided through a marketplace of providers, but there's no reason why you can't be a provider yourself. Uh, provide a private source of compute resource for your business units. Now this is standard technique, it's known as uh, hybrid, it comes from supply chain management, and you use it to mitigate transitional risks. Wait, cloud has risks? Yes, and I'm going to go through these, but before I do, a quick recap. Cloud computing is a real change. But it's nothing more than the standard evolution of a bunch of activities in IT. Many industries have gone through this. Yes, it creates real benefits such as economies of scale, focus on core. But don't confuse this with it reducing your IT budgets because the reality is it'll become more efficient, but your consumption, you'll just do more stuff with it. The big impacts are all about accelerated innovation. And that's why you'll do more stuff because your competitors will be doing so. Do you have choice over cloud? No. It's the same with electricity provision. But you do have choice over how you implement it. So that brings me back to the risks of cloud computing. Now the risks of cloud computing are standard to the evolution of any activity. They are basically uh, a group of risks known as disruption risks. This is related to the shift of an existing practice to a new way of working. So that's change of business relationships, loss of political capital, loss of previous investments. There are transition risks, which are related to the movement itself. So that's confusion over this new model, governance, things, concerns about data, trust in these new providers, security of supply, transparency of relationships. And lastly, you have the standard outsourcing risks which are, you know, is the activity suitable? Is there pricing competition? Are you being locked in? Do you have second sourcing options? Is there a loss of strategic control? Now, these risks, disruption, transitional outsourcing, simply act as a further barrier to adoption. So why hybrid? Well, hybrid enables you to reduce some of the transitional risks. Some of the stuff can go public, some of them you keep within your own private cloud. But it does so at cost. You lose some of the economies of scale, some of the, uh, your ability to not focus on that activity. Now, to give a comparison, uh, this is um, data from Microsoft, where they looked at the cost of private cloud against public cloud. I mean, few people are ever going to be able, few companies are going to be able to achieve the economies of large scale public cloud. People talk about Amazon's pricing, for example, at $740 for a small instant per, per year. Actually, when you look at the cost, it can get much lower than this. We, we currently calculate you can get down to about $220 per virtual machine per year, and that's everything. Building, electricity, equipment, software, the whole lot. But anyway, the use of hybrid is simply about balancing the benefits and risks. You take some of the advantage of public provision, you use private provision at the same time, and you use that to mitigate some of the data governance risks. Now, the benefits of cloud are large. I was thinking a way of trying to display this, so I'm going to draw a graph of speed, how quickly you can implement something against the price per year. And I'm going to specifically talk about infrastructure again. So I'm going to add my data. This is uh, one particular company, large pharmaceutical company. 72,000 minutes down to three minutes. So there's an enormous difference in terms of implementation. Now, when it comes to the price per year, well, that's a bit tricky um, because there's actually a gray scale between data center and your cloud. And that gray scale is all about volume operations and commodity use. So we can populate it with things like virtual data centers, enterprise clouds, private clouds, and public clouds. And we can do some comparisons rather trivially. So on the cloud side, we can compare the price of providing the same thing. And on the data center side, we can compare efficiency between data center and virtual data center. But the problem of comparing data centers to cloud is it's apples and pears. Most figures I've seen for data center provision rarely include the cost of electricity, the cost of aircon, the building cost, the cost of money. And equally, 
most data centers all the way down to enterprise clouds provide highly resilient machines, whereas public clouds is all about commodity provision. So you have to compensate for this by using architectures known as design for failure. So you get all that data, you put it together, and this is roughly the pattern that you've got. On one side, you've got speed differentials from 1 to 20,000. On the, on the bottom, we've got cost differentials from 1 to 50. And there's the data center's worst case scenario, very slow provisioning machines, very expensive, all the way down to public and private clouds, very fast, often very cheap. Now, I said earlier that Strassman showed there was no correlation between IT spending and business value. I, this stuff really isn't that important because you're just going to end up doing more stuff. But there is a correlation between speed and business value. So when people talk about cloud, they'll often say, it's going to reduce your budget. That's what it's all about. Oh, that's not true. You're just going to do more stuff with it. But where it does impact you is the speed at which you can do things, the speed at which you can innovate, the speed at which you can change. Cloud is really all about faster, more agile weaponry. Now, there's many other economic benefits, and we don't have time for this. So, um, unfortunately, what I'll, I'll mention two. One is, um, is disruption effects. So, does everybody remember the network battles? IPX, SPX, Banyan Vines, DetNet, those sorts of things? So, we had a plethora of different ways of providing networks, and every enterprise was using IPX, SPX. I mean, that was the future, that's what they were investing money in, and so forth. And then on the public side, TCP IP appeared, supported by open source systems, and most enterprises looked at it and said, we'll never use that, it's Mickey Mouse, we're gonna keep with IPX, SPX. Within five to 10 years, they all transitioned. They'd all incurred a massive migration cost. And of course, those businesses built around IPX, SPX were heavily disrupted. We're gonna see the same sort of effect with cloud. There's a strong correlation between cloud and open source, and we're already seeing public, um, the start of de facto public standards. There's another economic effect, which is reduced barriers to entry. So to explain this, um, Media companies used to have a privileged position because they, they controlled the means of mass communication. And then internet and digitization basically commoditized this. As a result, media companies suddenly were in a position they were fighting against a mass of different competitors. Anybody could be a journalist. Um, they'd lost a point of control. Uh, the commoditization of computer resources is going to impact some orthogonal industries. There are some industries which computer resources act as a massive barrier. Things like insurance, um, these are potentially going to be impacted by cloud. Now, I was talking to a civil servant recently, and he said this competition stuff is all very interesting, uh, but I, I work in government, we don't compete with anyone. Um, my response is very simply, you don't think China's spending 7.5 billion building cloud computing van valley because it wants to reduce its IT budgets. It's doing so because of agility, increased rates of innovation, reducing barriers into other industries, and disruption. This is all about competition, and the stakes are enormous. Um, this is from the CEBR cloud dividend. They calculate 763 billion of cumulative economic impact of cloud in Europe between 2010 and 2015. Thank you.